centuries ago, it's not exactly 100% clear when, but uh, quite a number of centuries ago, Helis uh, ceased to be in use in Tzitzis and Palace. Uh, again, it's some questions exactly when, but for quite a long time, people wore only white strings, only blood and only the white strings, and they didn't have Helis. And again, the Gemara discusses what the status of the midst of wearing Tzitzis and wearing Palace is with only blood and without Helis, and that's what the paragraph uh, uh, Helis begins to talk about. In the late 1800s, there was a uh, well-known Hasidic Rebbe, Gershon Hanach Leiner, who was known as the Radzina Rebbe, who decided to make it uh, one of his missions, a great Talmud Chochem, and also a self-educated, uh, brilliant person who was familiar with uh, science and things outside the direct uh, realm of Halakha as well. And he decided to make it a life's mission to try and figure out uh, what is the creature that produces a trellis and to reintroduce trellis into the uh, performance of the Mitzvah Tzitzit, the Mitzvah Talat? And he spent time and he traveled to Italy and to other places where he met with chemists and he was in a great aquarium in Italy. And he wrote Sarum, which are available today. He wrote Sarum, which described his uh, research. And he came to the conclusion that a certain species, a certain marine creature known as the cuttlefish is what produced the trellis. And he was convinced, he worked in association with a chemist, and he was convinced that uh, this particular uh, uh, species produces the dye that is used to manufacture this. <coughs> and after he brought that back to his community, so the Razina Hasidim, the Hasidim followed what the Rebbe tells him, so the, Has- the Razina Hasidim and other Hasidim associated with Razin began to wear trellis uh, on their, uh, on their uh, tzitzis. Some of the other Tomei Chom at that time questioned uh, his findings, but nevertheless it caught on at least in those communities. Fast forward a little bit to Rav Yitzhak Isaac Halevi Herzog, who was uh, subsequently the, uh, fir- he was actually the first rabbi Rashi, the first chief rabbi in the state of Israel. Rav Cook was the first rabbi Rashi, but Rav Cook was not alive when the state was established in 1948, uh, 63 years ago tonight, as it happened. And uh, Rav Herzog was the first, Rav Herzog was the first uh, rabbi who was rabbi Rashi in the state of Israel. So Rav Herzog, Rav Herzog, uh, Rav Herzog, did a lot of research on this subject as well. He was actually chief rabbi in Ireland before he came to Eretz Yisrael. He was chief rabbi, he was a rabbi in Dublin. And in fact, he did his uh, doctoral work on colors of the Torah, co- colors in the Bible, including Argomon and Cheles. And he felt he discovered through his research, included scientific research, 
he came to the conclusion that the Radzina Rebbe had made a mistake, he was actually duped by this chemist with whom he was working, and uh, Herzog said he had certain right ideas, but he was incorrect in terms of his conclusion, and Herzog came to some different conclusions. It's an irony of history that uh, when the Nazis in Achimam destroyed the communities of Radzin, so the dye makers there, you know, the whole community was destroyed, and when they reconstituted the community years later in Eretz Yisrael, uh, they wanted to reinstitute, to reestablish the manufacturing of the dye, but they didn't have the stuff, everything was destroyed, but uh, Herzog was in Eretz Yisrael, so he had the writings and his correspondence at the time, so in a certain sense, even though from the point of view of Halacha, he actually shlugged up, he actually uh, challenged the fact of the Rebbe, but it's because of his writings that they maintained the Radzina Chassidim maintained. Not a Yom Azeh, go to Eretz you see Radzina Chassidim and certain best of Chassidim who wear to this. However, uh, in more recent years, a group in Eretz Yisrael, following the work of Rav Herzog, uh, have come to the conclusion that there is a different uh, creature that is responsible for the uh, dye of Chilas, what the creature is called the Chilazon in the Gemara. They identify it with a certain type of snail called Murex Trunculus, and this has become popular in, uh, in Eretz Yisrael and in some places here uh, as well. And uh, we thought that uh, given that this is a subject that's really uh, in the news right now in the religious world, combined with the fact that the people learning Daf Yomi just finished his parak, uh, parak HaTcheles and Masechus Menachos, it was thought that it would be a good idea to uh, invite to our community, Baruch Hashem, two prominent uh, Rabbanim, Tamech HaChamim, who are well known to our community, to both of whom uh, wear Tcheles themselves, uh, to discuss the issues and uh, present some of the uh, issues that come up in this interesting and fascinating uh, area. And uh, our first uh, uh, presenter this evening will be Margaret Rabbi, our Herschel Schechter, Schlitter. Uh, Schechter and Twersky before, we're arguing with who should go first. And so Twersky won out, so Schechter's going to go first. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Uh, Shaft again needs no introduction to our community here in Tinek. He's uh, Hashem, spoken here many, many times, many, many shurim uh, over many, many years. And there's a rebbe to many of us, including uh, myself, and many of us who are alone here in town, turn to him with our shilas and for guidance in the direction, etc. And Shaft is going to talk about the question of well, whether a lost mitzvah can, in fact, be discovered, given that the trellis has been out of uh, use in terms of mitzvahs for so many centuries. <laughs> a lot of issues that come up with reintroducing something into the Misora which has been gone for so many years and without any further ado, it's my personal covet and the pleasure on behalf of the community to introduce our other government, Harsha Shepherd. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Rajin Amanda writes that he was interested in preparing for the rebuilding of the and reinstituting HaKorvus HaKorvonus and the Kohanim in order to be able to be marked with Korvonus have to wear special uniforms that was a big day kahuna the big day kahuna required Trevus and in the big day kahuna the Trevus is certainly Ma'ake in our tzitzis the Gemara quotes a dispute among the Tanoim what if you have tzitzis and you don't have any Trevus so the more quotes, there was a minority opinion of Rebbe that if you don't have Chavis, you don't have the mitzvah, you lose the whole mitzvah. And we you know the Baal HaMo'or and Masech HaShabbos, Paskans like that. He thinks that's the din. And the Ramban writes there in Perik Banam and Wikin, he heard that the Baal HaMo'or never would sit this. If he thinks that if you don't have Chavis, you're not here to the mitzvah, so there's no use in uh, putting on the tzitzis. And then when we were learning that Ramban, so Rachel was so surprised and said, you mean to say they buried the Balamor in the of house? It somehow didn't bother him that his whole lifetime he never wore tzitzis. And so Rachel was just fine, mean, they buried the Balamor with that of house. That's what the Ramban says, the Balamor never wore any tzitzis. But the accepted opinion is not Rebbe's opinion, the accepted opinion is like the Chachamim, the majority opinion, that uh, the Trevis is not Miyake de Salvav, if he wore tzitzis without Trevis, the mitzvah partially. The mitzvah the Shleimusa is Trevis with Lavan, and uh, without the Trevis, the mitzvah is incomplete, but there is a Kima mitzvah, like if a person performs Chalitza. So the Chalitza, the mitzvah the Shleimusa is to do Chalitza, the removing of the shoe from the right foot, and the spitting in front of the Yavam, and reciting of the Psukim back and forth, and the Yavam says Psukim, and the Yavam says Psukim, and the Yed, and we pass that the Yetzir the Mitzvah Shalom Bishlein Musa without the Rikike, 
without the spitting, without the Kriya Sapsukim, if you just uh, do the Haditha Sasano, but yet uh, you have fulfilled the mitzvah in an incomplete fashion. <coughs> so that's what we assume over here, that the tzitzis is incomplete. There is a Kima mitzvah, but it's incomplete Kima mitzvah. In Big Day Kuhuna, <coughs> the Perceptor says that Mokhaladekis, there's no dispute in Big Day Kuhuna, if the Kohanim don't have the Tchedis where it's supposed to be, so the big Kuhuna are simply not acceptable, and you can't be macro components. So what are we going to waste our time to build a base on English if you don't have any Tchedis? So the Radzina read the fell, we have to start preparing in advance. You can't just wait to build a base on English. The English will fly down from heaven today, right? Yom Atzmaud. And then we'll be stuck. We won't have any uh, tailors for the big day corner. So it'll be a waste. We'll have a place of English. We won't be able to use it. So he thought we have to prepare in advance. So he felt that he discovered uh, the identity of the Chalozan. And he encouraged his Chassidim to use his tailors. At that time, many Rabbanim agreed with him and many Rabbanim disagreed with him. So one of those who disagreed was Rabbi Yosher Der Soloveitchik, the great-grandfather of Rabbi Soloveitchik that we knew from, from a yeshiva from Boston. And um, he didn't send a letter in person. <coughs> he had an acquaintance of his sent a letter to the, to the Radzina Rebbe to explain why he disagreed. So the Radzina Rebbe has three different volumes. Now they're all printed together in one line. So one of the volumes, he collects all of the letters, pro and con, <coughs> letters supporting his chelus and all that is against his chelus. So the letter that he prints from an anonymous acquaintance, he doesn't give the name, he says, Santam Chochma is very close to the base of Levi, to the Biskirov, Rabbi Yosheber Salavechik, sent him a letter in the name of Rabbi Yosheber, why he's opposed. So in the letter that's in printed, it says, it says the following. If you would have come up with a new fish or a new sea animal uh, that we were not aware of, and you would explain historically why the trailers got lost uh, 900 years ago, whenever it got lost, 1,000 years ago, so then I would be the first one to jump on the bandwagon and also wear trailers. But you're telling me that it's this certain fish, like say the cuttlefish, this fish? He said, this fish, our grandfathers know about this fish. Our grandfathers, they knew about this all along. And they never used it for trailers. So we have a masari that you're wrong. We have a tradition that you're wrong. Because this fish was available to our, our ancestors. And they knew that that fish had this dye. It spits off this dye. And they never used it. So that's a, a, a masari that you're not right. If you can, he writes, if you, the Biskarov said, if you come up with a new fish and explain to me why historically it got lost, I'd be the first one to go home. The Soloveitchik family has a different tradition as to what Rabbi Yosheber Soloveitchik said. So we heard from our Rabbi Yosheber Soloveitchik in New York, and in Eretz Yisrael, the other, the cousins over there heard from our Elbow Soloveitchik, a totally different version of what the Beis Alevi said. And they, the way they say it over is different. That even if you're right, you're wrong, because we don't have a Masur. In order to identify what is Chita, what is Saora, what is Tchelis, and, and uh, colors and, and names, Oriz, there's a Machlekes, and there's a question in the Rishon of what is Oriz. There's a difference between Oriz and Dochen in Halachi. You say Oriz and Rizaynis and Oriz. So which, which is, one of the two is assumed to be right, either Oriz or Dochen. So everybody knows. You ask any Puerto Rican in Washington Heights, they all tell you Arabs. Is, is that right? You ask any Arab. Everybody says in all languages, so many different languages, <coughs> languages rice is called Arabs or Ora, something like that. So, Ois Machlaikis, what is there to fight about? So, Ram Soledchik says, no, it's a fake of the Dina. We cannot use a dictionary. We can't, just because people tell us that the Oris means rice, everybody knows in all the languages that doesn't prove anything. You have to have a Masora, a Masora from Rabbanim, from Talmud HaKham, from Jewish people. So since the Masora was lost, even if, even if Oris is rice, it's still a Sophie. And even if you'll reconstruct based on archaeology that, uh, that the Tchelis is the Burex, Trunculus, whatever it is, whatever you'll reconstruct based on archaeology doesn't count, because you need a Masora. So even if you're right, you're not right. <laughs> you can't rely on that. So it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money that you should come up with this new trailer because there's no Masur. So these are two totally different versions of what the Beis lady said. According to the letter that was printed by Rav Gershon Hena from the acquaintance from the Purim, 
of the Beis Alevi, he says Faket. He says if he come, if he would have come up with a new kind of a fish and explained to me historically why it got lost, I'll be the first one to go along with you. I'll, I'll wear your chelus. You tell me that the chelus is a fish that the chalazan is a fish that we were all aware of and it has this dye. We have a masori that contradicts it. And the way the Salvechi family says the, their version orally is that that's a different. You have to have a masori of what it is, and if you don't have a masori, then if you're right, you're not right. So Rabbi Fabio Cohen from Flatbush spent a lot of time <coughs> getting Shimush and Psak from Rabbi Yashiv in Eretz Yisrael. So uh, he, when he was back in America, he continued to correspond with him a lot. <coughs> so one of the letters that he wrote him was about these two versions of what the Beis Alevi said. Which does he think is the correct version? And in Tzilayma, that the correct version is the way it's printed in the Sefer of the Radzina Rebbe, what does he say about the new credits? So Rabbi Yashiv sent him back a letter, and he gave him permission to print the letter. Rabbi Feigl Khan asked, does he give permission to print it? He gave permission to say, print the letter. He has Mepharsid in, in a Torah journal. So Rabbi Yasha thought that the, the way the Salavechi family says it all, but to him doesn't make any sense. If you have an archaeological demonstration, that this, you have archaeological proof that this is the Trelis, what do you mean you need a Masora, what the word Chaloz is? If you can figure it out based on dictionaries and based on archaeology. So this is the Chaloz, what do you need a Masora to say what it is? So he thought that the more correct version is the way it's printed in the Sefer of the Radzina Rebbe. That the Beis Alevi said that we have a Masora that you're wrong. But if you come up with a new fish, I'd be the first one to go along. So that question number two is in, in place. So what about the new Chalozen that they just uh, discovered in Erzog? So Rav Aliyashi writes, it's a good question, i got to think about it. So he didn't answer. So the, uh, some, remember when Rav Soloveitchik uh, delivered this talk in Moria. He, he gave this talk on many different occasions. It was the Yorzai Groshi years ago about this, Shnei Suge Achela, Shnei Suge Masoro. And I remember when he was delivering this talk in Maria, so uh, the Balabatim didn't like it at all. So they had to learn it, Balabatim, then. They used to argue with him in the middle of the Shia. So one of them said, What do you do with the Gemara in Baba Basra? The Gemara says that Rabbi Barbachana was touring the Midbar. And the Arab showed him the Mesa Midbar. And when Rabbi Barachana came back to the Rabbanim and he told him about the grand tour that he had, so they asked Rabbi Barachana, there's a machlek, it's Beisham and Beisil, how many strings you're supposed to put for tzitzis? They put three strings in every corner that make six, and you're supposed to put four that turn out to be eight. So they asked Rabbi Barachana, did you look at the tzitzis of the Mesa and Midbar to see which is it? You have archaeological evidence, who's right, Beisham and Beisil? They said it didn't occur to him. So they said, idiot! <laughs> Rabbi Bachana, you're an idiot. You should have looked. He said, yes, Rabbi Salavechik. But you're telling us that archaeological evidence doesn't mean anything. So some, some, somehow he prayed out of Kashi, he explained how it's a riot there. It's an Ishkin Kashi. Then they started asking him, the Gemara has a Nachleik Yisachana, what did the tzitz look like? Did it say Kodesh Lashem on one line, or did it say Kodesh La, Lamed, and Yud Kei above that on, on the upper line? So Machlech is not telling what the tzitz is supposed to look like. So one time it says, don't tell me. I was in Rome. They, they, there's a whole story that Gemara tells. So he says he was in Rome and they showed him in the Vatican and the, in the uh, Oitza there. They showed him the, the Kalim from the Beis Amigdash and he saw the tzitz and it's in one line. So don't tell me these mice. So the Gemara says that the archaeological evidence seems that it is good. But on the other hand, the Raman Paskins, that's what the Raman Paskins say, Kodesh, La, and the Yud Kevavki above it. So the Kesem Mishnah is, how can the Raman Paskin against archaeological evidence? The Tana said, I saw the tzitz. So the, so the uh, Kesem Mishnah answers, archaeological evidence is good. But every Kohen Godel had a different size forehead. So they had to make a different tzitz that should fit every Kohen Godel. So there must have been many tzitz. And the Gemara says there was so many Kohen Godel during the period of Baishani. Several hundred, no, how many hundreds of kind of done when they work? So he found one sits, maybe that shall like Kalacha, maybe the others did it the way it's supposed to be, Kurdish La and Yud Kevavki above. The Chayna of Chayna, there's a discussion in the Beis Yosef, in the Prisha, in the Chastilin, there's a famous dispute between Rashi and Rabbi Natan. What's the order of the Parshas and the Tvilim? So the Chasidim went to the Rashi and Tvilim the Rabbi Natan. It's a suffix. So they found the, the Akronim quote that they found archaeological evidence. 
They found Tfilin the Rabbi in the time and they cared for Rabbi Cheskel Arnavi. So obviously in the days of the Arnavi, somebody was very Tfilin the Rabbi in the time. So that's a right that that's the correct say to our So the other Rechayim said, maybe they were possible and that's why they were going as that in, 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 in the next to the Kev Rabbi But they're all assuming that archaeological evidence is acceptable. The only question is, is this good archaeological evidence or is Nishkei right? So, so that's why Rabbi Yashiv wrote to Rabbi uh, Feibelkan. He thinks that the version that's printed in the Radzina Rebbe Sefer makes more sense to him. He doesn't understand this version that the Salamechik family says by orally that the Beis Alevi said you have, to have, you have to have a tradition. If you don't have a tradition, even if you write in that land. Rabbi Salamechik kept on insisting in his pshat. There's a famous Gemara where the Gemara has in the Gila. The Talmidim in the Yeshiva didn't know what the word metate means. The Titasim and metata hashmen. They didn't know what the word metate meant. So on one occasion I heard Amsa that they read the maid in Rebbe's home. He asked one of the other maids, please take the metate, the broom, and, and sweep out the floor. Oh, so when they heard the maid use that word in Hebrew, she spoke Lashna Kurdish. So then they understood that it means a broom. And they didn't know what the what uh, what Chalav Lugas was. So also they heard the the Amsa the Bay Rebbe, the Maid of Rebbe he said to someone, What are you eating Chalav Lugas or something like that? Then the Bachim were coming in to listen to the Shia Rebbe <coughs> and spurts. A few Bachim came in at a time, a few Bachim came in at a time. So she said, What are you coming in? Le Serigan. They didn't know what the word Serigan meant in the Mishnah. So she said to the Talmud, what are you coming in, Lesser? Why don't you all come in at one time? What do you bother me every time I have to open the door? So that's how they found out what the word Serigan meant. That was allergic said, why did they look in a dictionary? An lexicon. That was his wish. Why did they use a lexicon? What, what they have to wait till long so that they're ready to So he said, the answer is that you need a masera. If you don't know what the word means, you're not supposed to look in a dictionary. I'm um, said, so they're ready. Well, had a masera from ready. So it does taste a masera. The end of Balabat and Yesra, I'm so allergic. That's the pshat and the Gemara. The Gemara says they didn't know what the word Yehovcho. The person says, Hashlach al Hashem Yehov, Chuhu Yechal Kalech, the Habiyad Rabbonam. The Bachim didn't know what the word Yehov meant. So, Tila was an Arab who was uh, traveling on the highway, and another person uh, another person was going with a wagon, and, and uh, the fellow who was walking was schlepping a peckle on his shoulders. So, the Arab on the wagon said, Why don't you take your Yehov and throw it on my wagon? And come up and ride, and ride with me. So that's when they found out what the word Yehov means. Yehov means a pekel. Hashlach al Hashem Yehov, for your pekel of dying is given up to the Rabbanu Don't die it, don't worry about the future. Let the Rabbanu Shalom worry about everything. So they said, there it's not Amsa the Bey Rebbe. There was an Arab who, who told him what the word. The so then she said, no, in the Zoyar when it says, Ahu Taya, it means Eliyahu Anav. So the Balbatim will look at it. It takes every Gemara that seems to indicate that if you have any indication what the word means, if you have archaeological evidence that it means this, he accept our God, so he, he drained everything around. And I'm said the Bay Rebbe, that's called Masur. And the Arab is Eliyahu Nabi. So the Balabatim, I remember, were not so keen about this whole interpretation. So that's, that's his version. That's the Salvechik family. That's their oral tradition. And Rabbi Yashif thought that it makes more sense to say that you can restore uh, Masur as our archaeological evidence. What happens if it turns out that you're wrong? <coughs> what happens if it turns out that this is not the halos and we made a mistake? So you're not yet to the mitzvah of tzitzah. So the Gemara says in Perakat Chelis that we were just learning the daf. <coughs> I'm, I'm unfortunately, I'm not learning daf yami. Those who are learning daf yami, what they learned, the Gemara says, if you bought Chelis, that's a fraud, that's an imitation. So the Gemara says, so you lost a lot of money. It's very expensive. Mar says, Lo Yehiel Olavon, so supply to Yehiel to the Mitzvah incomplete. So the Mar says, Beferish, that if you have imitation Chelis, it's not the real McCoy, so the din is that Chelis is not Miyakev, and you still Yehiel to the Mitzvah in an incomplete fashion. The worst you can do is uh, to lose some money over here. Are you obligated to invest money? It costs a fortune of money. Are you obligated to invest money to buy this Chelis if you're not so sure? We're not 100% sure that this is the uh, authentic Chelis. Maybe it's only a suffix, so would you say suffix, the rice of the to spend so much money? So in the yeshivas, they say a svar. Did some point out that the Balatani writes in his Shulchan Aruch he writes this svar in one place, that suffix, the rice of the only applies if a person is in the whether he, he, 
he's not sure if the lulav and esrik that he shook was kosher or not. So if he shake lulav and esrik a second time with a kosher of lulav and esrik, he'll know for sure that he's yotzei the mitzvah. So then we would say suffik the rice in the the first one of it. Lulav is their rice, so we would tell them you have to shake the lulav again without a bracha and make sure that you be yotzei the mitzvah. So there's a svara. Everybody tosses about the svara in the yeshivas. The suffik the rice in the only applies. You have to be machmer, and after you do it the second time, now you know for sure that you have fulfilled the mitzvah. But over here, you're going to tell me I should spend a hundred dollars to buy something that may or may not be trailers, and may turn out after I put it on my bag, I haven't accomplished anything. I'm still not sure if I fulfilled the mitzvah, because I'm not a hundred percent sure. <coughs> I don't have a hundred percent archaeological evidence that this is trailers. It's a suffix, it's a possibility. So there is such a story that this doesn't count. You wouldn't apply in such a case, suffix there, I said, look, so Rabbi Nachum Zemba, uh, uh, Rabbi Nachum Zemba was a super genius. He was killed by the Nazis. He was a big, uh, one, of, one of the greatest Polish Yudayim who was killed by the Nazis. So he had a son who was uh, engaged to get married and he died at a very young age. So after the son died, he published a, a correspondence that he had with his son. The son was learning out of town in a different yeshiva. And he published the correspondence <coughs> that he had that to memorialize the son in memory of the son. So the, the letters of the son are very strong. The letters of the father are ten times stronger than the letters of the son. The son had knew, had, knew how to learn very well. And the father knew how to learn much better than the son. So one of the letters, Rabbi Nachim Zen, he deals with this topic, whether he says, he says, yeah, in the yeshivas they say such as Vara, and he points to where the Balatanya writes like this in the Shulchan Aruch, but he says it's a fine Svara, but in the Shulchan Aruch it says not so. And he quotes chapter and verse where it says in the Shulchan Aruch, that you're obligated to do something be suffic, because suffic the rice of the chumr, even if after you'll do it, you won't know for sure whether you have accomplished anything. It could be that you accomplished nothing. You still say suffic the rice of the chumr. So that's why the Pashta says that uh, if you think that this may or may not be the chalazan, so suffic the rice of the chumr should be required that we should, we should spend money and, uh, and perform the mitzvah Bishlay Musa. The Ariza was quoted as having said that the mitzvah Trelis only applies with Mancha Beis Amikdush or Yitkai. With Mancha Beis Amikdush Kain, there's no mitzvah Trelis. So this is really, many point that this is really a misquotation. What the Ariza was going to say against the Gemara, the Tanoim and Amoroim, and the Gaon and lived after the Chodim Beis Amikdush. And they all bought Trelis. So what do you mean? The mitzvah Trelis only applies with Mancha Beis Amikdush or Yitkai. So I never saw it inside, but the Rabbanim who saw it claimed what it says in the Arizal is a different thing. The Arizal is posing a question, how could HaKadosh Baruch Hu have allowed such a tragedy to occur to the Jewish nation that the Trelis got lost? He, he, he allowed, the Rabbanim Shalom allowed such a tragedy to happen, the Trelis got lost. So the Arizal says, Nitpah <coughs> the main accomplishment of wearing Trelis, it's only this mancha based on English or Yekayim, this mancha based on English Kayim. You're not accomplishing that much. But the Arizal didn't say a halachic statement against all the Talaim and all the Amorai and all the Goyim that this mancha based on English Kayim. You don't have to wear Trelis. He's not saying a halachic statement. He's giving historical comment. How can our Kabbalah have allowed the Trelis to disappear? <coughs> the Satma Rebbe, Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum, was a super genius in learning <coughs> and healing. You have uh, his swarm. So in one of his swarm, he explains what that result said, based on a Gemara. It's an Iluyish Einfall, but it's uh, still problematic. The Trelis is supposed to be the color of the sky. A question, the color of the sky, when? So Rashi, in his commentary on Chumash, in the end of Parashat Shlach, Rashi says the color of the sky at midnight. Uh, because Makas Bechorvis occurred at midnight, and the word Trelis means death. And that uh, it means death to the, the firstborn in Mitzrayim, to the fur in Mitzrayim, and um, it's supposed to be the color of the sky at night. And the Rambam writes on, so it's supposed to be the color of the sky in the daytime, in the afternoon, a, a light blue. Rashi says a dark blue. So, whatever, the color of the sky. So, there is a Gemara, in the end of Brachas, where the Gemara says, uh, uh, the Gemara has in the last parrot all kinds of miscellaneous brachas that you say when there's thunder and lightning and you see mountains and valleys and hills and all kinds of strange animals and good looking women and the handsome, uh, handsome people and so on. <coughs> so the Gemara says when you see a beautiful uh, sky, a clear blue sky, so there's a special bracha. So then the Gemara says, but we don't recite that bracha this man. Is that because after the Churm Beis the color of the sky changed. It's not the right color of the sky. 
So the Satmar Rebbe said, that's exactly what Darizal said. The Tchelis has to be the color of the sky, but the sky color has changed today. So, so it's the wrong color. It's an Ilu Yishayim form, and it's still against the Gemara. The Gemara says, the Hel get Tanoim and Amoraim, and the Goyim who lived after the Chumim Beisamit, the sky color color, after the Gemara says, after the destruction of Beisamit, they still want a Tchelis, however you're going to slice it. Still against the Gemara. So the Pashta says that we still have an obligation to wear Tchelis even though it's only a suffix, even though we're not sure, and even though there's no masora, <laughs> we don't have a masora that it's incorrect. So at least me suffix, one should be obligated to wear this trailer. Some people feel uncomfortable. It's Mexi Kiyuhara. What do you mean? The big rabbon and big tzaddik and the gazoil and the goyim and all wear the trailers. So we're going to show that we're bigger tzaddik and we're more, uh, we're more medactic and mitzvahs than them. The Gemara says there's an issue of Mexi Kiyuhara. You're not allowed to fulfill a mitzvah in a way that uh, it looks as if you're uh, very arrogant. So you look at the Gemara, Mexi Kiyuharo is when a person is volunteering to meet his chasidus. When Bikirajin, he's not expected to do this. He wants to do something with Nimishur Sadin, and he's not such a big Tamat Chacham, or in the presence of his Rebbe. The Gemara in Baba Kama has. Yeah, the third group, the Talmud is there in the presence of his Rebbe. The Rebbe is not Machmer on this, and the Talmud is Machmer. So that's a uh, chutzpah. Who does he think he is? He's being Machmer in the presence of the Rebbe. That's not their Herod. So the Gemara says, Roy Len Adolso. You should put him in Nidui. But over here, we're not talking about a Midas Hasim. He says in the Chumash that he's supposed to wear Tchelos. It's just, it's not, it's not the Yuharot. Maybe it is Yuharot, but you have to wear the Tchelos, whether you like it or not. So what do you have to be concerned about? That's the Kiyuhara. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a consideration over here. In fact, <clears throat> there is a din in the Chumash Baltigra. You have to, we have to observe the mitzvah says how Kavish Bogu gave them. It says, Baltaisit Baltigra, you're not allowed to add on, you're not allowed to detract. So the Gemara gives an example of, the Tanoim gives an example of Baltigra. A person only puts in three tzitzes in three corners, he doesn't put in the fourth corner. A person puts in three parshas in a film, doesn't have the fourth parsha. So the Beis Alevi and the Chulas has an essay about that din and the Gemara. What do you mean? He puts in three parshas in the tefillin. So he's not yet to the mitzvah. What, what do you call it, Baltigra? There's a mitzvah of tefillin. If you only have three parshas, you're not yet to tefillin. We pass them that the tzitzes in all the four corners are my akram zezer, not like the satanot. So we pass him, if you don't have no the four corners, you're not yotze anything. So what do you need a din of Baltigra? If you only put Tzitzis in three corners. You're not going to the mitzvah of tzitzis. So the Chumash says you have to wear tzitzis. You wear a four corner garment. You didn't put tzitzis in all four corners. You have a battle of mitzvah. What do you need about people? So the Beis Olegi develops the whole theme a little bit based on the Rosh and the Rosh Hashanah that Baltigra only applies in a case like the Gemara courts. The Gemara gives an example. You have a Mizbeach that has four corners. And you have a carbon, there are carbonists that need four zrikas on all the four corners. There are carbonists that need two zrikas on two corners. So, if a per, what if Bidiyevit, a person will be makre of a carbon that needs four zrikas, and it'll only do Bidiyevit one or two or three zrikas. So, Bidiyevit, the machlek and satanai, we pass them that the carbon will be kosher Bidiyevit. It's like performing chalitz, and you didn't do the kriyas apsukin, you didn't do the rikike, you only took off the shul. You makayim the mitzvah shalom b'shnoi musa. So, if knowingly, I know I'm supposed to do four zrikas, and I don't bother to do all four, I only do one, two, or three, I'm in violation. I'm about to take because I'm yet to the mitzvah b'diyevet, and I did it l'chatchila the way it's only good b'diyevet. Or any other mitzvah like that. But if, but if you have a mitzvah where all the four parishes of the tefillah are ma'akim, so the Beis HaLevi thinks, you don't need, that's not about tigra. So here, by the case of tchelus and love, and we pass them that tchelus is not ma'akim. So the mitzvah the shleimus is to do tchelus and love. So if the person has the, wears a four corner talus, and he knows that Tchelis is available, and he can afford it. He's not that poor, he can afford it. And he doesn't bother to buy the Tchelis, he only buys the Lava, then he's in violation of Baltigra. So Baal Gavad Bessa would have been better, he shouldn't wear the Talis at all. If you don't wear the Talis, you're not Mechuyim in Tzitzis. The obligation of Tzitzis only applies if and when you're wearing a four-corner garment, then you're obligated to wear Tzitzis in the four corners. If you don't wear a four-corner garment, Nish Mechuyim, we go out of our way. We go out of our way, Tyson says, I practice Ashkenazim, and we practice, we go out of our way, like Moshe Rabbeinu was chalashing to enter Eretz Yisrael. So he says, why did he want to enter Eretz Yisrael? He left the material with his boy, Mituba. 
He wanted to swim in the Kinneret. He wanted to eat the delicious food. What did he need to go to Eretz Yisrael for? <coughs> so the Gemara says, in order to fulfill the mitzvah of Satliyibot. So, so Tyson says, what does he need it for? If you live in America, you're not mechayim in the mitzvah of Satliyibot. Who tells you to go to Eretz Yisrael? So you see that it's a mitzvah chasidus to put yourself in a situation where you're obligated to observe more mitzvahs. So Tyson says, based on that, even though we're not obligated to, but it's a mitzvah chasidus to go out of your way to wear a talis, for Kona Garmin in order to have the mitzvah tzitz. So there are those who say, those Baal Ha'atais disagree, and they say, Ah, chutzpah, who do you think you are, Moshe Rabbeinu? When you'll be on the level of Moshe Rabbeinu, then go wear a four-cornered uh, towers. There are Svadish, there were Svadish communities. Now they moved to Eretz Yisrael, so they all took on everybody else in practice, but there were Svadish communities. They only allowed their Rabbonim to wear a towers in an Arab country. The Balabatim, it was considered a chutzpah on their part. Who do you think you are? Like Moshe Rabbeinu? So if you go out, your, uh, going out of your way to wear a four-corner garment in order to be high in tzitzis. So bottom line, if a person doesn't wear a four-corner garment, he's not about to any mitzvah. He didn't do the midas chasidus. Ashkenazim consider it the midas chasidus to go out of your way to wear a four-corner garment in order to be high in the mitzvah of, uh, of tzitzis. But if you wear a four-corner garment and you're obligated to put on trailers and lover and the trailers is available and you don't bother to buy it, then according to the Beis HaLevi, that's the definition of Baltiga. So it's a shame better not to wear the talus at all than to wear the talus and not to wear the trailers. You wear the talus without the trailers, you're in violation of Baltiga. You don't wear the talus at all, you didn't do anything wrong? You didn't do Amidas Hasidus? So that's the sales pitch, that's the uh, argument why uh, the proper thing should be that one should have to wear uh, a talus and put on the trailers, be subject. Maybe this is the correct uh, trailers. Exactly how many strings do you have to put into the... How many strings of white, how many strings of blue? So that's a machlaikis, which is not quoted in Shulchan Uh Rashi and Taisis, in the beginning of Perak HaTchelis, the first half are of the opinion that you have to have half and half. Two of the long strings should be blue, and two of the long strings should be white. When you tie them together, you tie them together, so you're going to have four and four. Four of the strings are going to be blue, four of the strings are going to be white. Uh, the Rambam's opinion is that you only have one out of the eight strings should be blue. So it's not that you take a long string and you dye half of it blue. If you take a string that's already twined and you dip it into the dye, so the dye is just going to affect the outside of the string. It's not going to make the inside blue. It's not going to be through and through blue. So it's complicated. So what you have to do is take wool and dye wool blue, and then you have to make a string which is going to be half from the dyed wool that's blue, and half of it is going to be white. That's not such an easy thing. So according to the Ramam, you have to take one out of the four long strings should be half blue, one end of it should be blue, one end should be white. So at the end of the day, after you fold them over, you're going to have one out of the eight strings that are blue, and seven of them are going to be white. And according to the writer, you know, the writer disagrees with the Ramam. You have one long string, one out of the four long strings should be blue, the other three long strings should be white, and you tie it together. How do we pass them on Shulchan Aruch? They don't quote this Makhluk. It's the Shulchan Aruch. The only opinion that's quoted, that's relied on, is Rashi and Tosus, that it's half and half. We have halachas based on that assumption in the Shulchan Aruch. We have had halachas for the last few centuries since the Shulchan Aruch was written, based on the assumption, like Rashi and Tosus, that it's half and half. Everybody knows that if some of the strings of the tzitzes got torn, so if you have two full long strings that are the full size, and the other two strings are less, as long as those that are shorter than they should be, as long as you have a little bit, uh, the Gemara gives you how long it has to be, so then it's okay, but you need two long strings should be kosher, that's based on the Tesis, Tesis quotes up in the top, that two strings white, two strings blue, you need one unit should be shorter, the other unit as long as it's half, uh, half the size is also good. Then you have the Mishnah Guru, who writes Halach let's say, a person has a silk baguette, so you can use silk strings. Uh, you can't use silk strings on a, on a cotton baguette, you can't use cotton strings on a silk baguette, but you can use silk strings on a silk baguette. What about uh, woolen strings? The woolen strings are good, whatever material the baguette is made from. What if the strings are going to be, some of the strings are going to be wool, and some of the strings are going to be silk? So the Mishnah Brura passes la halacha from the Malbim. The Malbim has a sefer arts and sachaim at the beginning of Shulchan Aruch, where he says, as long as each unit is full, if you have two strings wool and two strings silk, that's acceptable. If you have three and one, it's not good. 
So the assumption there are several other places also where the Vishnu Guru and the Shulchanah has the assumption that that's half and half. So if people want to wear a famous today, the Pashta says they should wear the famous. How many things should they wear? So the assumption in the Shulchanah is that it's two long strings blue, two long strings uh, white. I, the Chumash says psil. Psil means a string. So Rashi in his Kamkara Chumash explains the word psil does not mean string. It says, Dor ikesh uf salto. In Shiraz Hazim. No, it says, Dor ikesh uf salto. So Rashi writes, what is salto? So Rashi writes, Tzedrei. Dor ikesh uf salto. Tzedrei the generation. So psil tchelis means tzedrei. You're supposed to wind the string of the tchelis. The Chumash doesn't say one string of tchelis. It's supposed to be two strings of tchelis, two strings of lovin. The tchelis, the purpose of the tchelis is to wind it around the white string. That's how Rashi writes on Chumash. How many units do you have to have? For many centuries, we haven't had tchelis, so we have four units in the tzitzis. You tie double knot on top, then you have seven, then you tie double knot, you have seven, eight, eleven, thirteen, you have double knots on top and on bottom, and in between these different units. That's called the chulia. The unit that's seven, eight, eleven, thirteen. Where did these magical numbers, seven, eight, eleven, thirteen, where do they come from? So the Gemara says that this man that you have trailers, trailers is supposed to be Dono Larakia. And the Gemara says in Chagiga there are seven heavens. So the person is so excited, he's in seventh heaven. So it's based on the Gemara. The Gemara says based on Sukkim and Tanakh that there are seven heavens. So uh, since the trailers is supposed to be the color of the sky and there are seven heavens, so you should have a minimum of seven. Can they get the seven heavens? And if you have seven heavens, you have to have six Avir in between. If you don't have empty space in between the first heaven and the second, in between the second and the third, so that's all one heaven. So if you have seven Rikiyim, seven heavens, you have to have six Avir in between. So six and seven is thirteen. So the Gemara says, because when you have Trelis, Trelis is supposed to be the color of the sky. It's supposed to be man, you have the sky, that you shouldn't sin. Tzachatim's commits with Hashem, Asisam, Aisam, so you should have a minimum of seven and a maximum of 13. So that was the practice for many centuries. We had 7, 8, 11, 13. A minimum of 7, and a maximum of 13. So Tesis on that Gemara has two interpretations. And the Ramam and the Raiden have this dispute. Minimum of 7 and a maximum of 13 was. So we have been in for so many generations. A minimum of 7 krichas in each chulia. We have 4 chulias, 4 units, beginning and ending with a double knot. That's our pra- different opinions. But that's Ashkenazic practice. We make five double knots and we have four chulias, seven, eight, eleven, thirteen. So we have been assuming all along that seven, a minimum of seven kriches per chulia and a maximum of thirteen kriches per chulia. So the more popular opinion in among the Bab, that was one deal in Tesis, the more popular opinion of Bab Tesis was not so. How many kriches, how many wines, how many wraps around do in each unit? Three. The Gemara says, a chulia has to have a minimum of three krichas. You wind it around three times. So what does it say, minimum of seven? No, a minimum of seven chulias. Instead, we make four chulias. So the says, that's because we don't have chelas. So the whole seven, eight, the whole minimum of seven, maximum of 13 is irrelevant. Chelas is double the rakia. So you don't have chelas. So well, what's the whole story with the seven, with the 13? It's not double the rakia, but when you have chelas, then this then applies, you have to have the seven. So instead of having four Four chulias, like we've had for so many centuries, master a minimum of seven chulias and a maximum of thirteen chulias. Whoa, that's going to be an awful lot of string. And our practice is we make a double knot and a double knot. Every time you have another chul, you have another double knot. Every double knot uses up an awful lot of uh, string. So if you want to make thirteen chulias, you're going to have you're going to have fourteen double knots. You're going to have a string that's uh, five times as long as any string that we, we don't. So we don't do. The maximum, we're not going to do the 13. We're going to try to do the, the, the minimum of, of seven chulias. So if you want to satisfy the both opinions and taisvis, you got to have, instead of four chulias, you got to have seven chulias. Then if you want to satisfy the other thing, you have to have, each chulia should have a minimum of seven krikas. You have to have seven times seven is 49 with eight double knots. You start, our practice for so many centuries was Ashkenazim always make uh, double knots. So for many centuries we did four chulias. So they said because the whole thing is irrelevant because we don't have chelus, it's not done with rakia. So forget about the seven thirty. But if you think that you really may have chelus, uh, uh, then you should make uh, the din of the seven. So you should have seven chulias with seven kriyas each. Exactly. What do you wind? What do you wind around? What? 
So Rashi said, Psil means salto, today. You wind around. So you only wind around the blue. Everything is you winding around is blue. So the Gemara says, the first time you wind around, you have to wind white. And the last time you wind around should be white. And then you have blue in the middle. So what exactly does that mean? So the Rambam is the easiest opinion to say. So the Rambam says, let's say you're going to have seven units. Each one's going to have seven krikas. You're going to have double knots. You're going to have eight double knots. So the Rambam says in the first unit, you're going to have seven krikas. So the first krikas, the first wraparound should be a, with a white string. And the next six in the first krikas should be blue. And the next seven is blue and blue and blue and blue and blue and blue till the last unit. So the last unit should be six krikas of blue. And the last krikas is white. The very first of the, you have seven times seven is what? It's 49. Sphere is on it. So the first, the first krikas and the last krikas is going to be white. And all the other uh, 47 krikas in between are going to be blue. That's the Ramam Shita. That's easy. Easy. Taisus and the Rai that present other possibilities how to read the Gemara. It's simply a question how to read the Gemara. So one opinion is that you keep on alternating. You have white, blue, white, blue, white, blue. That's quite a trick. You have to keep on switching strings. You white, then you do blue, then you do white. The other opinion is the first, the first chulia should be white. The second chulia should be blue. The third chulia should be You alternate, not you alternate one and one and one and one. You alternate. The first chulia should be white. The second chulia should be blue. The third chulia should be white. And then there are different variations over here. So there are different traditions from the days of the Gaonim. The Gaonim who still wore trailers. That was the time that the trailers disappeared, about the period of the God. So they have in the Sefer Adam different versions exactly how to read the Gemara. So that, at least the Gemara says, that's not Miyakiv. That's not Miyakiv. So uh, different, different practices had to do with it. A big question would be, um, I, met, I met a, uh, a man in Los Angeles, he asks me, are there any sources in Talmudic literature that the trellis is poisonous? So I said, why? So he tells me he works for the federal government, and his job is to test all the dyes in the garments, because there are children, some adults, who like to chew their clothing. So if the color, if the dye is poisonous, so you got a problem. So the government, the federal government, makes sure that clothing manufacturers don't put poison in his dye. So he says he tested the new trailers and he says it's a stick of poisonous. So he wants to know, are there any sources in Talmudic literature? So I started to think. The only thing that came to mind is that Rashi and his commentary on Chumash. Rashi says trailers comes from the word tichlo, which means death. And trailers is supposed to be the color of the sky at midnight because it's supposed to represent Makas Bukharis, which occurred at midnight. Which maybe is supposed to represent death, maybe it's supposed to be poisonous. And so that's, that's the only thing I knew about that. So here you have a question how dark should the dye be? If you, if you dilute it with more water, it'll be light blue. If you don't dilute it so much, it's going to be dark blue. So you're supposed to make it like Rashi, dark blue, like the color of this dye at midnight, so almost like black. The sky looks practically black now. Or is it supposed to be the color of the sky in the day? That's not a problem. I like this Rashi and Rambach. I remember Rav Sarvechi once gave a Yorzai Drosha on um, Sitzis. So the Chela Kagada, those who remember, the Chela Kagada always used to be related, not always identical, related to the Chela Kagada. So the Chela Kagada, he was discussing whether the Chela is supposed to represent Midas HaChesed or Midas HaDin. So part of the Drosha was that according to Rashi, that it's midnight and it's Makas Bukharis, then it's supposed to represent Midas Adin. According to the Rambam, that it's the color of the sky in the daytime, it's supposed to represent Midas Achesed. And that was just the first line, and I got lost after that. I didn't understand the rest. He was quoting passages from Zohar, which you, get, you have to have the intelligence of a 40-year-old to understand. And I didn't have that intelligence. I probably was being 40 years old when he gave that rush. So the rest I didn't understand. So that's the question, how dark should the blue be? Tell you the truth, I don't know if that's Me'akev. That's not discussed in the Toskin. If you made it, instead of dark blue, you made a little lighter. Instead of lighter blue, you made it a little darker. They don't discuss that. According to Rashi, it would be possible to make like the right. I, I would imagine whatever you do. As long as they write the color blue, even if it's not exactly as intense as it should be, or as diluted as it should be, probably would also be good for the other. But uh, my impression is that uh, at least the trailers that they have now should at least be considered a suffix. 
and the suffix they rise in the Chumash. My impression is that it would be better not to wear a Tavos at all than to wear a Tavos without putting on Chelis. If the Chelis is available, and you don't bother to put it on, then you're, uh, strictly speaking, it sounds like you're in a violation about Tikra. But if you don't wear the Tavos at all, so you won't do it. There's no, there's no problem at all. There's much, more, there's much more to discuss regarding all of the aspects that I discussed, but uh, the time doesn't allow, and I'm sure uh, the next speaker will have something on the other side. I can't hear the next speaker. <laughs> 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 With the Kahana, we will be wearing the Tchels. <laughs> It's time maybe for just uh, one or two questions for either Chef or Torsky. Anybody have any questions? Yes, um, so I heard from, from, from uh, Rebel Yashir mm-hmm. and he was concerned with the Akhanat, the silk pelts, which is used in the Akhanat. You can't have, say, a white beggar with red scissors so that maybe it's blue and it's not red as pelts, then it would violate that. The problem with that, there was an, an issue in case the chalice is not accurate, it's not the right one, but there is a, a chumrah that's quoted in the Shulman Arab that the string should be the same color as the garment. So we usually wear a white garment, so if the chalice is not authentic blue, then it's supposed to be white, then it's not white. So this is the Ramam's opinion. Most of the Rishan disagree with the Ramam. The meaning has been for many centuries that were are to wear dafke, a white garment and white strings. So you can't go wrong. But strictly speaking, the Gemara says, like, uh, Rabbi Kroski quoted also, the Gemara says, Lo yihei alalavan. If you fell in and you bought the uh, Kla'ilon, the Gemara says that since it's going to be kosher anyway. So you won't have the Tchelis. The Gemara says, the Tchelis is not like that Ramam. The Tchelis were kosher for the Ramam. So we always wear white, uh, white because and, and white strings. So the evidence would do what we do. Clear for a former student, so I'm not going to answer this. You said at one point the Rashi and Tosh of the say that the number of Kaila strands have to be for Rashi. I told him to, which means four by four. And a few minutes later, I thought he said that Rashi says it's one long Kaila all around all the others. No, Rashi says that the word seal means to wind around. But the purpose of the chelis is to wind around the others. But how many strings do you need? So Rashi and the Gemara, the first half of the is like Tesla. So you have one long chelis wound around two white and one chelis? No, no. You have two long blue strings and two long white strings. And then you should wrap around the chelis. So it's two wrap around the chelis. Or four wrap around four. Mm-hmm. You wrap around with one string around the seven. You take one string and wind around the seven. So we have, uh, now for many centuries, we have four units. And now many people are trying to make seven units to satisfy that thing in the cases. You don't necessarily have to use the same blue string every time that you want to wind around. Wind around. You always use whichever string is the longest. When you go to wind around, it's going to get shorter. So you should use the other string that's, every time you finish winding, making a double knot, a different string is going to be the longest. So you always use the longest string because after winding it around, it's going to become the shortest string. They always wind one string around seven. And the purpose of the trailers is to today in. Still. Still means uh, to wind around. I, I thought that the, the black stripes that we have in the towels is supposed to be a zeker for us for the trailers. Yeah. So those that wear trailers should not be wearing a towels with black stripes to be consistent. There is no need. There is no need for any black stripes. The Mishnah Bura quotes that the black stripes, the towel should really be white for two reasons. The, one reason is that in the, in the Sefer Daniel, he has the vision of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is an old man with uh, long white hair and wearing a white garment. So the Kabbalim say that the white garment that the Rabbanus one was wearing and the vision of Daniel, the mouth the mouth was white as snow. So the white garment was a towel. So because the Rabbanu Shalom is begged as a white towel, so that's Alpi Kabbalah, we should wear a white towel. And then Alpi Nigla, Alpi Amache, the Chosh is for the Ramam. That the Ramam says that the color of the garment will be orange, then the Chutim should be orange. The color of the garment will be green, so the Chutim should be green. 
So Ramah says, we don't want to get involved. So you write that you wear a white garment and white stripes. Right. So, the, so why do you have black stripes? And Mishnah Mura, black stripes, that's Zechel and Chelus that's missing. That's on the assumption, like Rashi and Chumash, that the Chelus must be the color of the sky at midnight. That's like black. Other people have blue. Instead of black stripes, they have blue stripes. That's following the Ramah, that the Chelus must be the color of the sky in the daytime. They make a Zechel and Chelus there. So if you have real chelus, you don't need the black stripe. It is not there if you have black stripes. You don't need it. You don't. You don't need a zechel of chelus if you have the real mccoy. Or if it's not the real mccoy, so that's the zechel of chelus. You have the imitation chelus. That'll be the zechel of chelus. Thank you very much, both to the of the chef who's gotten married in just two moments. <laughs> <laughs> Any physicist any physical will tell you that 613 nanometers is not blue. In some place, past the red, maybe yellow. And look at them. So, but what you have them, dye solution.